Reverend Jesse Lee Peterson hosts a live radio talk show in Los Angeles and the Jesse Peterson Show on Media One in South Central Los Angeles. He has been featured on news programs including CNN, World News Tonight, and Nightline with Ted Koppel. Reverend Peterson is a successful entrepreneur, motivational speaker, and author with a decade of experience in rebuilding the family. Thank you very much for uh, coming out, and thank you for inviting me to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking about the government and its relationship with the people, and I want to make it clear that there is a, a need for government. I have a tendency to talk about the negative, and it seems as though we don't need it at all. There is a purpose for it, uh, but we have allowed the government to use us in the wrong way, to govern us in the wrong manner. And I'm, I'm going to make an attempt to show you what would happen when that happened to us, when we allow that to happen. I'm going to be talking about the, uh, the UN and their rights, uh, children's rights, how destructive that is and it should not happen. Uh, but first I want to tell you a little bit about myself and how and why I started the organization that I have, the purpose of it. I'm from Alabama. I grew up in a little town near Montgomery, Alabama. And I grew up on a plantation. Uh, my grandparents worked in plantation. My parents worked in plantation. And I have to honestly tell you that I don't remember one day of my grandparents teaching me to hate white people. Uh, I never, they used to sit around at night after work on the porch and talk about life, but they never talked about or taught us to hate. They always taught us to work hard, uh, to, to treat people the way we would like to be treated. Uh, character, they talked about that. They had some flaws, but they tried to show us the right way. And at that time, the laws were against black people for the most part. But yet, we wasn't taught to hate. Uh, I left Alabama at the age of 18, and I moved to uh, Los Angeles, uh, California. And as a young man, I discovered there, there were a lot of things that I didn't know about life. I didn't know how to deal with the challenges of life. I was very emotional, uh, insecure, 18 years old, so, you know, I had a lot to learn. And plus, my father wasn't around to show me and, and be a good example for me, to, you know, to show me how to deal with issues. That's the purpose of a father, is to show the family the right way to go by being a good example. So I didn't have a father to show me that. He wasn't around. Um, I went to California at 18, and I tell you, I went through hell well, lack of better words, <laughs> hell. And I began to wonder, why is it that I'm having such a hard time? Why can't I deal with life? So I started to look around to get an understanding of how to deal with life. I joined a couple churches around town there in L.A. I went from church to church looking for the answer. Um, I started to listen to people like Louis Farrakhan and, and Jesse Jackson and Maxine Waters and others. And they were saying to me, that it wasn't me, that I wasn't the problem. The problem is white people, that America want to hold you back, that the man, the white man, has his foot on your neck, and because of that, you can't make it, because of racism, and just all kind of what I call evil things that I believed. And because I was already angry that I didn't have a father to show me the right way to go, and I didn't know how to deal with life, I believed a lie. I believed that uh, as a black man, I couldn't make it. And as I believed that, my life got worse. You know, it, it just, inside, I, I lost sight of reality. As we all know, and if you examine yourself, anytime you get angry in the wrong way, anytime you judge someone else, it, it, um, it comes back on you. It prevents you from seeing reality. A good example that I use, and I like to use this example because most people can relate to it, in a marriage couple, married. Um, you can love your wife. She's the best thing in the world. You know, no one is before her. And the moment she gets you angry and you resent her, she looks different to you. It's not the same woman that you were married to. You know, like, who is this woman? Because now that you've judged her, you can't see the reality of who you're with. You now hate this person. She can't do or say the right thing. And that's what happened because I had this resentment toward white people. I couldn't see clearly. And all white people looked bad to me. I used to think, when I, when I saw white people in church, I couldn't believe they went to church. 
You know, I'm thinking, how can white people praise God and hate me because I'm black? I had believed a lie that came from the leaders. And the leaders, you know, they stood tall because the media had promoted them as being right. And I was a young man, and I didn't know it better. You know, I thought they were on the right track as well. But what happened, to make a long story short about my life, because it, it could go on and on, is that as I resented white people and resented my challenges, uh, it nearly destroyed me. And I ended up on drugs and, and on welfare. And the reason I ended up on the drugs is because I had so much conflict within me. And I needed to get rid of the conflict, so the drugs was an easy way out for that. It makes you feel better. You know, like an alcoholic, he feels good when he's drunk because he doesn't have to face himself. But that's what the drugs were there for. I ended up on welfare, and the reason that I got on welfare is because I heard that it is, uh, if you're black, at that time, if you're black, you can get on welfare simply by telling them that you're on drugs. And drugs was considered to be a, a disability. And so I went down to the uh, county office there, and I told the worker, the social worker, I'm a drug addict. She said, oh, okay. So they sent me over to a doctor who was right there in the facility. And he said, well, what's wrong with you? I said, I'm a drug addict. Oh, okay. He wrote it up, gave me my little paper. I gave it to my social worker. And I start receiving, started to receive $300 a month in cash. They paid my rent. I had $100 worth of food stamps. I, uh, uh, I, all my needs was met. And the sad thing about it, I got worse instead of getting better because now I didn't work or do anything. And if you don't work, you seem to lose um, a part of yourself. You don't develop that self-esteem that work brings out. And all my life I've been working. I worked in the cotton fields and everything else all my life, but because it was so easy not to work, I stopped working. And I got lazy, I didn't care about anything, I developed a low self-esteem. And to make a long story short, I suffered and suffered and suffered. And finally, one day I was thinking, I'm a man, I live in America, and it doesn't make sense to me that I can't make it in America. If the white man is making it, if Jesse Jackson and others are making it, why can't I make it? What is wrong with me? And so one day I was sitting in my prayer closet. When we read the scriptures, it says, go into your closet, be still and know God. You know, shut up, stop whimping and whining and begging. Before that, I, I went into my prayer closet and I would say, oh God, give me a wife give me money, give me a car, you know, bless my mama, bless my everything. You know, selfish prayer. But this time I wanted understanding. So I'm sitting there asking nothing of God, and this is true. At an instant, I realized, I saw that I had hatred in my heart. And it was that hatred that was holding me back in life. It was that hatred that was destroying uh, my self-esteem. And it was wrong for me to hate. But the first thing I saw about it is that I resented my father first. Because I knew I was disappointed about my father not being around, but I had not realized that I had resentment for it, that I had judged my father for not being there. And the Bible says, how can you say that you love God, of whom you never see, and hate your father, who you see all the time? But when I saw that, it, I wept. You know, I, just, I mean, tears just came because I was sorry for resented my father because I realized he couldn't help himself. And then I realized it had uh, held me back in life. And so I uh, went to my father and apologized and to my mom for being mad at my dad and passing it on to me. But the beauty about it is that my eyes was open and I also saw that I had been used by people like the Reverend Jesse Jackson and Maxine Waters and Al Shopton and Louis Farrakhan and, and the NWCP, they had used me. They, they used the black comp uh, people for their own personal gain, for their own desire for power and wealth. And the way that they use us is keeping us angry. They keep you mad. They make you feel good, then they make you feel bad. They tell you that, oh, you can go to the white school, uh, but they won't let you in. You need affirmative action. They keep you mad. And as long as you're mad, as long as you're angry, they can control you. And when I woke up and realized that, I'm like, wow, this is good news. I saw it for myself. God allowed me to see it. No one had told me that. I can tell you, honestly tell you, up until the last 10 years, I never heard 
one black person say, or one white, to be honest with you, that you're being used by your own black people. They, they didn't say that to me. I never heard it before. But God allowed me to see it. And I thought, oh, this is good news. I'm going to run and tell black people that it's not the white man. It's the black man that is holding us back. Our own people using us for their own personal and selfless gain. And so I, uh, I talked to a friend of mine, and he allowed me to use his building. He announced on his radio program that I wanted to have a meeting with black people about these issues. So I called a meeting. Uh, I talked about the same issues. It went well, and we had another one. And from that, we started the organization you know, with the purpose of rebuilding the family by rebuilding the man. And the reason we wanted to rebuild the, the man, because when I look at the order of life, God has ordained it that the man should be the head of his family. And I'm telling you, nothing else is going to work but that. It's not an ego trip. It doesn't mean man is better than woman. It's just the order. And it's a perfect order. And it works when done in the right manner. It works. And so I, I knew that if we can talk to the men and get them to examine themselves so they can see what is wrong, they can bring their families back to order because when you come back to God, your family will come back to you as well. So uh, we will focus on the black man, even though it's for everybody now, so that we can get them to wake up. I went on the radio show. I said, well, you know, the next thing I'll do is start a, a radio program so I can talk about it over the airways in the black community. So we went on a, a radio station, KTYM, in uh, Inglewood. It's a Christian radio station. We were talking about forgiveness. We were talking about hard work. We were talking about the family. All the things that are in the scriptures and in our hearts. I go on the radio thinking that this is going to be good news. And to my surprise, I mean, I was shocked. I was called nigger, Uncle Tom, a sellout. I've been paid by the white man. Just uh, They told me I hated myself that I hated blacks, I hated men, I hated women, just everything. They, I mean, it was just, this hostility just came out of everywhere. And I was shocked to see that because I thought if they can hear the truth, they would be happy to hear. But that's not necessarily so. And I'm sure many of you have discovered that by now. If you think that people love the truth, uh, I challenge the wife to tell your husband the truth about himself and see what happens. <laughs> or tell your wife, you know, you know, do you like that suit? No, I don't really like that. What's wrong with it? You know, they get mad about it. They want the truth, but they don't love it. We don't love, Americans don't love the truth the way we used to in the past. And this country was built on truth. In spite of what we've been told, it was built on truth. But I would call nigger Uncle Tom, and uh, the manager was threatened. And finally, they had to let me off that station because the manager was a white man, and he was like, I can't handle this. So they let me off, but as God, God always does. He opened up other opportunities for me, and one thing led to another one. Another story is that I debated one of Louis Farrakhan's ministers there in L.A. on uh, Channel 9, a local TV station there, and they were going on about this thing about the blue-eyed devil and, you know, how they, how they talk. And I just told him, Farrakhan is a, is a, is a racist. Farrakhan is of the devil. And they were talking about the Million Man March, and I thought that that was an embarrassment to black Americans to go to Washington, D.C. And, and, and worship the devil. They follow Farrakhan to Washington, D.C., knowing that he has hatred in his heart under the uh, pretense that he's trying to bring people together for the good. It's all lies. Farrakhan is not on the side of good, and we all know that. But the danger of that is that Farrakhan rose to, a, in my opinion, a Hitler status that day because he got the approval of a lot of the black preachers. He got the approval of the media. He got the approval of many people who knew he was wrong before, but uh, verify his existence uh, by participating in that rally. That's a dangerous thing, and we're going to live to regret that. I promise you, unless Christ returns soon, we will live to regret that. But anyway, after that debate, uh, a couple of guys uh, drew a gun on me and told me that I was going to die, you know, because I disagreed with that, because I stood up against Louis Farrakhan. Another time I was on Nightline uh, during the L.A. riot and, uh, and the O.J. Simpson trial. You remember all that, that mess that was going on? And uh, Ted Koppel 
came around to me and he said, Reverend Peterson, what do you, who do you think the problem is? What do you think the problem is in the black community? And I stood up and I said, Maxine Waters, the NWCP, the Black Caucus, they are the problem. And I tell you, that, that room went in like a roar. It's like, <laughs> you, you would think that the Klansmen walked in with their suit on or something, you know? It went in a roar. But this is needed. The truth is needed in order to change the situation. It's the truth that's going to set us free. The one thing that happened in that moment of my prayer closet is that God took away fear from me because I used to be a very insecure person. I'm embarrassed to tell you, as a man, I was very emotional. I had a lot of insecurities. I couldn't make decisions. I, I, I didn't represent manhood. And mainly because I didn't have a father to show me how to do it. I had fear and doubt. But in the moment that Christ caused me to repent, he also took away fear, doubt, worry, insecurities. Uh, I don't look for people to love me. I'm not looking for love. I'm a free man. And it has been that way for the last 10 years. And it's not changed. It's only gotten better over the years. And he allows me to see my challenges and how to overcome them. And as I deal with them in a the proper fashion, I get better in life. And I absolutely love it. I can honestly tell you that I have perfect peace within me. Perfect peace. I've never had it before, but for the last 10 years, I have it. And there is nothing on this earth that I would give to lose it. Nothing. Nothing is more important than that. And with that kind of courage, and see, it's inside of all of us. And the Bible says if we get to know ourselves, we can discover it. And the greatest thing that a person can do is to know his or herself. If you know yourself, you can be free. And it's God that allows you to see yourself. But and then you can overcome anything. But anyway, I'm out on the battlefield doing this. What I realize is that uh, black people have been used, as I said earlier, by the Reverend Jesse Jackson, uh, the civil rights leaders, you know, Maxine Waters and all, uh, the liberal elite whites, you know, the, the Democratic Party, and some of the Republican parties, because they're not all doing their jobs in the way that they should. One reason I became a Republican is because I repented from being a Democrat, and then I <laughs> overcame <laughs> But I, I like the idea of the Republican Party, the love of God, you know, the love of country, hard work, the family. But they're not representing themselves, for the most part, in the way that I think that they should. But the Democratic Party, what they did is they came in, not all, of course, the, the, the uh, liberal elite, hostile group, the social, socialist group. They came in to the black family, and they said that the, the government owe you something. The United States of America owe you. You know, here's a welfare program. Here's a governmental program. But you can't have it unless you get rid of your, your man, get rid of the father, get rid of the husband. If it can get rid of the father, the rest is easy. Because the father represents the truth. You represent the light in the home. Again, it is ordained to be that way. And so Eva understands that if it can get rid of the father, it could wipe out the rest. So they got rid of the black man. Most of the black men left their homes and turned their families over to the government. The government came in and gave welfare and gave uh, uh, the public school system, which is now a social camp for destruction. Uh, they gave the most important thing that happened, and I think the most destructive thing that happened, it took away the principles and values of the home the love of God, the love of country. And so now there is no solid foundation or anything to build on. There is no foundation. So now the government can control the family or the breakdown of the family in any way that it can or any way that it desires. And I can honestly tell you, not all, of course, but most, most blacks today, thanks to the destruction of the father, thanks to the overtaking of the government, and the line and the seat that has been passed on by the uh, political leaders, Jesse Jackson and others, that most blacks today are immoral and un-American. Immoral and un-American. Un it's sad to say it, but it's a fact. And unless we deal with that, we're not going to change it. An example of immorality. Also, I want to tell you how the church has also fallen for this, uh, the same thing by way of government. Immorality. Before the uh, civil rights movement started, began, 
homosexuality was never accepted by black people. Was not accepted. I remember my uncles used to go to Florida during the summer to work, picking oranges and things like that. And they would come back with stories about homosexuals in the city. And it was scary to hear what they said. But it was never accepted by black people. And the other thing is, sex out of wedlock was happening, of course, but it was, a, it was embarrassing. If a girl should get pregnant out of wedlock, it was an embarrassing thing. She would have to stay home and kind of stay away from the rest of society until she had her baby. There were many uh, cases where the man had to marry the woman because fathers and mothers didn't want their daughter to have to endure that type of shame. Today, if a black woman get pregnant, and not just black women, you know, we know that it's passing down, I'm going to talk about that too, but if a black woman should get pregnant in the church, and instead of putting her out, she's promoted now. You know, they have baby showers. They celebrate as though she's married. There is no shame in that. Just think about the wickedness of that, the destruction, how far that is away from what God intended for us to be. He didn't uh, build the family because he had nothing else to do. It's not like God sitting around one day and saying, oh, I have nothing else to do, so I'll make a family. It's a reason for that. And, and evil is destroying that, and we, as men and women, are allowing it to happen. But they, they, uh, girls can have babies out of wedlock, just like that. No, no. There's no shame in being on the welfare. Everybody and their mama is on welfare. I wish I could say it wasn't true, but it's absolutely true. There's always exceptions. There are some good black folks out there who understand this and, and know that it's wrong. You don't hear from them because the media will not allow it to happen. But they're out there, and they're concerned about these issues. But there are many blacks who would kill you to be on welfare. Because the more you give them, the more they want. They lose their self-esteem, and now they're dependent on the government to take care of them. Thanks to the, to the uh, government for doing it. Thanks to the politicians for encouraging it. And thanks to the fathers for not standing for their families, standing on principles. Uh, there is hatred for the white population like never before in history. And the sad thing about it, blacks won't look at it because they've been told that they can't hate. You can't hate white people because you don't own anything. How crazy is that? But they believe it because they can't see. They're angry and cannot see. So they believe whatever their leaders tell them is true. And that's what the leaders want. That's what the government want. And that's what is happening to us right now. I have to tell you that if we don't wake up to this reality, if we don't wake up to what is really going on, all of us will suffer from it. There's nowhere to hide. There's nowhere to run. Wherever you go, evil will come. And you've got to deal with it one way or the other. The sad thing about this whole situation, not only are the blacks in denial about what's going on, most of white Americans are in denial about what is happening. They are not necessarily in denial about it, but they are afraid to deal with it for fear of being called racist, for fear of being uh, uh, told that you don't like black people, you don't like Hispanics, you, you know, you're just racist. And whites won't stand up. So we're not getting any truth coming in to change the situation. But as a result of not standing up to it, it is now spreading out into your communities, into your schools, into your churches, into the supermarkets. It's spreading because that's what happens with evil. If you don't do anything about it, it will spread. And so white Americans must stand up and speak the truth. If you love God, you have a responsibility to love your enemies. And loving your enemy means to be honest. Tell them the truth. It, it, uh, God said that we should be honest, love one another. He didn't say we were going to like the truth, but we have a responsibility to tell the truth. And you, as white Americans, have the responsibility to tell the truth. I am not an Afro-American. I am an American. I was born here. I love it here. You couldn't pay me to go to Africa to live. Really, I go there to visit and see what's going on, but I want to hurry up and come back to America. And I don't see any black people rushing to get out of America. Have you noticed that? You know, how many people seen a boatload of people leaving here lately <laughs> trying to get out? And they got all these complaints, but no one is leaving. They can leave. 
I love America, and I'm willing to fight for my country. I'm willing to fight for the family. But you, you can only do it with truth. You need truth. You need understanding. You need guidance to do it. You cannot have fear in doing it. The government is destroying us. A good, another good case of immorality, and especially in the black community. Then we're going to move on to the, uh, the UN. We just ha uh, recently had a, a, a big incident with the president, President Bill Clinton. Don't blame me. I voted for the other man. <laughs> but uh, with the Monica Lewinsky deal, Bill Clinton, uh, uh, all evidence indicates that he's a liar, he is an adulterer, he's a lawbreaker. And yet, all the polls indicated that anywhere from, anywhere from 80 to 90 percent of black people supported him, knowing that he's morally bankrupt. Bankrupt. And they supported him. A lot of the black preachers, I'm sure you saw him in the churches, you know, praising the Lord and just dancing with the Bible. I mean, I was horrified by that. I mean, God must be upset with that. But yet, the black people, the black churches, encouraged it. They didn't speak out against it. And the reason that they didn't is because he represented what they stand for, lack of character. You are not, white people are not the problem in, uh, in the lives of black people today. It's a lack of values. It's too much government in their lives. No families, no self-reliance, no self-control. And the government of the United States of America has done this to the black community. And we've allowed it to happen. And now the kids are angry. They're involved with gangs. They, they're mad. And there's going to be a warfare if we don't wake up to this reality. We must wake up to it and wake up soon. Because there will be a warfare going on of all the anger. I worked in juvenile halls. I worked in the public school system. There's a program in the public school system that called Project 10, at least in L.A. I don't, I'm not sure if it's in this area. But it's a homosexual program that has been in the public school system for 10 years. And it has taught our children that it's okay to be homosexuals. And two men making out is fine, two women making out. And now the children who disagree with that, they walk into the bathrooms at school and they catch guys making out with one another or girls making out. I'm telling you the honest truth. I'm, I hear it all the time. And when the kids complain about it, they, they, are, being, they, are, they are punished for it. They are, they, are, they are being told that you're discriminating against homosexuals. They are being put out of school because they disagree with it. The parents are not doing anything about it. The, the government is not doing anything about it. No one does anything about it. How can we win? How can we change the situation if we allow this kind of thing to continue to happen to our children and to our country? It's a bad situation. These are just some of the things that I've had to go through. I've been called every name in the book. I've been tested and tried with them all, and they all fail because I don't really care about what they think of me. I used to when I didn't have truth. I love truth now more than I love anything else in the world. It means everything to me. And so I don't care what they think of me. I don't care. I want you to think about that for a moment, how the United States government have taken over a nation of people, black people, just open your eyes and look. You don't need a statistic to tell you. You don't have to wait for the TV to tell you. Open your eyes and see it for yourself. Common sense will show you that it's true. But just think about the United States of America government having that type of control over the people for the last 40 years because it hasn't always been that way. It just recently, the last 40 years or so. Prior to that, uh, blacks were better off then than they are today. Booker T. Washington is a man that he's the founder of Tuskegee Institute. He educated himself and all arts were against him. He went on to, to start the school. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of examples of that. We have, blacks were uh, enslaved uh, physically by the law, but not mentally. Now they're enslaved mentally. That's the worst enslavement you can possibly endure. The worst. Because if you can take a person's mind, you can control them. You really can, and that's how they are being controlled today, mentally and spiritually. And we need to wake up to that. Now, we have talked about the government of the United States of America. Again, I want to emphasize that there's, there are good aspects of the government. All right? 
Because I don't want people to say, oh, you're putting down the whole government. You just want to, it's not the case. I just want to show you what can happen when we're not in control. Um, by now, I'm sure many of you have heard of the United Nation. Is that right? At least many of you have heard of it. Now, the United Nation is a, a government uh, uh, that is organized by nations of the world, all the world governments coming together. And with the United Nations, unlike the United States, at least with the United Nation, I mean the United States, you can vote them out. You know, we, we have the right to vote. So we get fed up, you know, we had enough, we can vote out. But in the United Nations, we do not have the right to vote. You do know that, right? Yeah. That's scary. I mean, you guys don't look too scary. But you can not vote. <laughs> in the um, United Nations uh, uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child, they have decided somehow or another in their minds that they're going to tell us how we should govern our children. Now, the United Nations is made of some people of homosexual persuasion, uh, godless people, people that do not believe in God, uh, people that do not believe in the family. They don't believe in those kind of things. Uh, people that hate everything that is good, the United Nations. They want to govern us. They want to tell us how to govern our children. And many, I brought some of the uh, information with me today to try to make some of the points about what they are doing and an uh, 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 aspect of their treaty. But uh, before you leave the meeting today, we have a lot of material in the back there. Uh, if you want to make sure you take some or, and read it and, and pass the word on. There's nothing like knowledge. It opened the eyes. You'd be surprised. Uh, make sure you take some because I don't have enough here to give you, but you can look at it, you know, once I'm finished here. But make sure you call the John Burke Society or, and get the information and get it out. We got to get it out. I'm shocked at some of the things I'm discovering about the United Nations. For example, um, on the rights of the child, I'm going to read just a little portion. You can't see it, but I'm going to put it here. We'll have it in the back. Um, <clears throat> on Article 18, the state shall render appropriate assistance to parents and legal guidance in the performance of their child rearing responsibility and shall endure the development of institution, facilities, and service for the, child, for the care of the children. What that is saying to me and that the state want to be the provider of your children. They're going to determine how you should care for them. Just as the uh, United States government, a portion of it, has determined how the blacks should care for their children. Oh, let me just say this. It just occurred to me. As a result of destroying the father and now giving the mother welfare, the, the uh, United States government now controls the children in the juvenile hall, in the court system, the parents have no rights anymore. And I'm going to give you some example of that. I'm telling you, if you doubt me, visit some of the juvenile, juvenile courts in this, in, this, in, this, in this country. You would be blown away. It would blow your mind. So the, uh, the UN want to be the provider of your children. They want to give you the facilities, you know, the uh, nursing cares and the, the school system to provide for your children. And you will not have anything to say about it because you can't vote them out. You can't tell them no. It would be against the law. You would end up in jail. Another thing is that on Article 27, the state shall take appropriate measure to assist parents and other responsible for the child and shall, in case of need, provide material assistance and support programs, particularly with regard to nutrition, closing and housing. That means that they're going to feed your children. They're going to let you know what they can wear. If you decide that you want your child to go to a school and wear a uniform, you can't do it because that's discriminating against another child. What if your child wear a blue suit and my child can't afford to wear one? You can't say no to that. They have to wear whatever the UN decides. Another thing that the UN is doing under the heading uh, under the pretense of wanting to do right by the children is that they're ushering in the end or bringing in homosexual programs, homosexual rights, you know, rights to abortion, 
they are bringing those in too while we're sitting back and allowing it to happen. Another thing on uh, Article, um, let's see here, 13, I'll just put this here for you. Article 13, the child shall have the right to freedom of expression. This right shall include freedom to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kind. Now that's deep. If your child decides that they want to look at sex magazines or read sex magazines and you as a parent say no to that, you can't do it. You as a parent would be punished because under the UN laws, the child now have the right to do it. Just think about that. Look at the system now with sex and how kids are having sex out of wedlock and sex before time and how emotionally they're becoming. They're being destroyed. You as a parent, under the laws and the rules of the UN, cannot prevent that from happening. Now, if that's not enough to cause you want to run out of the room, I don't know what it's going to take. Pornography, you can't say no to your child, according to the UN rules. Imagine this. God gave us, the father and the mother, the responsibility to set the example. The UN take away that right to do it. This is wickedness. Wickedness. This is not man and woman just doing something. This is total wickedness, a warfare between good and evil. A lot of the churches, especially in the black community, are now subject to the government. What the government has done is giving them money under the head in the programs. You know, here is money to, for Head Start, or whatever it is. And the churches have accepted the money. And now, as a result of that, churches cannot, ministers, not all, but most, cannot rebuke when the, when the, uh, the audience is wrong. They, they cannot tell a mother, you, you, you know, you shouldn't be having sex out of wedlock. Why are you doing that? They cannot tell a, a woman who wants to have an abortion why she should not have an abortion. Because if they do, they're going to lose the money from the government. And I, we have tried so many times to get churches to come out and protest with us in demonstrations against abortions, against homosexuals. Many times they will not do it. And the reason that they tell us is because there are congregations, there are members in their church who are homosexuals, who, are, who believe in abortion, and they don't want to offend I've heard this with my own ears. They do not want to offend. Are you guys as shocked about that as I am? No? Can they say yes? Uh, no? <laughs> I mean, I can't believe this. There is no difference anymore between the world and the church. You know? I mean, we're, we're supposed to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. We, as men and women of God, we're the ones who are supposed to set the example, show the world in the right way to go. Well, I can barely find it. I don't know about you. I know there are some good churches I'm not talking about all, but many, 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 many. I, have, I want to tell you two more incidents, all right? I know my time is running out, but so much is coming up in me. Uh, there's a church in L.A., West Angeles Church of God in Christ, uh, Bishop Blake, is the, uh, the founder of that church, or at least the head minister of it. Recently, a couple of years now, they had a, the election was coming up to re-elect a, a mayor for the city. And they wanted a black mayor instead of a white one. And so they called together all the black city councils and uh, many other black preachers. They invited me. They didn't know who I was at the time, so they invited me. <laughs> and uh, uh, many other politicians were there at the NAACP. And speaker after speaker, let me tell you this, the media was there in the beginning, but before the media started, the media left. So it was just us black folks there. But speaker after speaker went up on the podium and talked about the evils of white people. They said things like, we need our own black mayor. Uh, the contract with America is contract with white America and not black America. We need a black contract. We need a contract with black America. So I'm sitting there listening to this because there was an audience there of young people as well. I raised my hand 
and they tried to shut me up. No, we're not taking questions. And I said, no, 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 I need to say something. I came here to say something. And they said, well, write it down. I said, no, I don't want to write it down. I want them to hear this one. Because when you write down questions, they don't ask. Have you noticed that? That's a trick. I don't fall for that anymore. <laughs> but <laughs> I finally insisted on asking my question. And I said to Pastor Blake, how is it, Pastor, that you're called by God and you allow these people to come in and teach this kind of hatred to young people? When you have Reverend Murray at First AME Church passing out condoms to the children and no one says or, do, or does anything about that. He got mad at me. He just yelled and screamed and just kind of read something out of the Bible. And he said, this is why I don't like to ask questions. There are always troublemakers in the audience. And, and then from that point forward, each minister that went up to speak just kind of made little sharp remarks about me. And I had to sit there and endure it. But you know, I love the truth, and somebody got to speak the truth. I'd rather endure the hell that comes from the world as a result of standing for truth than to have a conflict within me and live in a lie. I like the truth better. Somebody got to do it. One last incident. Fred Price of uh, Christian Christian Center. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He has one of the largest black churches in Los Angeles. It's called the Faith Dome. He has a TV ministry as well. Right now, he's teaching. He had a fallout with one of his white minister friends. And they were real close. This minister helped build the church, gave a lot of money to it. And they had a disagreement on an incident. Fred Price got mad and went and denounced this preacher. And right now, he's teaching hatred in his church with the Bible, using the Word of God to teach hatred. And the sad thing about it, no one, well, I won't say no one, most people are not doing anything about it. And his church holds at least 10,000 or more people. He's teaching hatred in the poor pit. And people are praising the Lord, worshiping God, and being told a lie. And nothing is being done about it. Socialism in the church, in our church. There's no hope if we don't do something. The other thing about the UN, I thought you may like that one. Don't you just love the warfare that comes from the world for from speaking the truth. I love to give me truth anytime. Um, let's see here. Article 15 on the uh, UN, the rights of your child. Remember now, this is how the UN want to tell you as parents how to discipline your child. As a matter of fact, they don't want you to have anything to do with it. They want to they wanna control it. They, they have taken the father out, destroyed the family. They have uh, rendered the mother helpless because she got to, you know, be there for her children and try to do the best that she can. She's the father and the mother now. And that's difficult. But they don't want you to have a say-so in it. Article uh, 15, state party recognized the right of the child to freedom of association. Meaning that if my little son come home one day from school and say, Daddy, I want to I wanna join the, the Crips or the Bloods. I want to be a gang member today. Or I want to join the radical homosexual movement. No, son, you can't do that. Yes, I can, Dad, because the UN law says that as a child, I have the right to do it. Well, son, I don't care what the UN has to say about you. But, Dad, you can't do anything about it. I'll just give them a phone call. Uh, if the United States doesn't get out of the UN, you cannot tell your child that he or she can join a game or cannot join. No. That's bad. That's bad news. Isn't that bad news? That's bad news. Another one I'm going to give you, then we're going to move on. Article 16. No child shall be subject to arbitrary or unlawful interference with his or her privacy. That is terrible. Your child uh, is on drugs. Uh, he goes into his room, smoke a joint. A joint is a, you know what a joint is? Yeah, okay, come on. All these holy people. No, I'm here. Uh, <laughs> a joint is marijuana that you roll up into like a cigarette. They can go in there and hide it in their bedroom, and under the bed or anywhere, 
and according to the UN, oh, the child have the protection of the law against such interference or attack. When you go into his bedroom and look in the closet to see if, if he or she has marijuana or any type of drugs there, that is considered attacking the child, according to the UN. Tell me that that's not wickedness. That is wickedness. That's not, that's wickedness. That's crazy. That's insanity. I work in the juvenile halls and I have a, a home for boys and girls who are coming out of the juvenile hall. Sometimes we have to go to court for them. Many kids have gone to, uh, to foster parents or uh, to the juvenile hall simply because they got mad at their parents. You know, the parents say, wash the dishes. No, I don't want to wash the dishes. You have to wash the dishes. I'm not going to wash it. She, the child call up the social worker and say, my parents are abusing me. It doesn't have to be true. It just needs to be said, right? So the social worker can come and take the child out. Now the parents go to court to try to get the child back. The judge or the, and the social worker decide, no, you're an unfit parent. You can't do it. And the courts say, no, you can't take your child back. The UN wants to do the same thing. And again, I want to remind you that in the United States, we can vote the judges out. We can vote the politicians out who agree with this kind of stuff. But we cannot vote out the UN. So once these laws are, are passed and the United States accept it, that's it for us, for our children. Again, I want to remind you they have destroyed the father already. Let me, let me do this. You don't have to confess it now or tell me about it, but examine your own lives and be honest. Think about how you felt about your father and what you felt like when he wasn't there for you. Either he was out working, or when he came home, he didn't spend time with you. He didn't sit with you and say, you know what, how was your day? You know, how did, how did, how, what are you thinking about life? You know, how do you feel about me? Is there something you need to know? Think about that emptiness that you feel, you know, like something is missing. Well, what is missing is that guidance of the Father. You know, God ordained it that we look at our Father and see it. But that is missing. And now, wickedness understand that. That's why it attacked the father first. Then it takes out the children. It takes out the wife. And the UN is doing the same thing. I just had this thing where UNICEF says, every child is theirs. <laughs> UNICEF, every child is our child. It's not yours anymore. You, know, you have nothing to do with it. It's their child. Uh, Hillary Clinton said, uh, it takes a village. Was she talking about the village of the UNICEF? It takes a village. Can you imagine a village telling your child that you can't do it, you don't need to do what your parents say? You know, look at the black community, please, and see what's going on as a result of the government taking over. I want to uh, give you some ideas of how to overcome this. I don't want to be all gloom and doom. But I do want you to understand that socialism is at work, and it's taking over, and it's destroying us. And it doesn't have to happen that way. We still have a chance to turn it around, especially if we understand that it's a spiritual warfare. We have to first uh, put back the family. We have to come back to order. Fathers and mothers and children together. Fathers and mothers are supposed to be the perfect example for their children. They're supposed to set the tone. They're supposed to set the standards so that when the kids go out into the world, they won't fall into diverse temptations. You know, they would see the right way to go. So we must put back the family. We must put it back. The second thing uh, is that the United States uh, has signed on with uh, the UN but they have not ratified uh, the treaty yet. So the UN, United States, need to get out of the UN. I can't say that enough or loud enough. The United States need to get out of the UN. We must get them out and get out now. Not tomorrow, now. Not after Bill Clinton leave, but now. Uh, there you go. Uh, 
And one way that we could do that is that uh, you can write uh, to your congressman in support of H.R. 1146, and that is the American Sovereignty Restoration Act. So you need to write to your congressman in support of that bill. That's one of the ways that we can get out of the UN. We need to get out because, again, once you get out, once they get in, UN get in, we can't vote them out. We have no say so about anything, and they want your children. I have to tell you that I am a proud member of the John Birch Society. I really am. And I've, I've met some of the best people that you ever, 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 ever want to meet in the John Birch Society, true Americans. I can honestly say that. And uh, the John Birch Society has information that will open your eyes and blow your mind. And uh, it will, it, you know, just as I'm compelled to do what I do, what I do in life now is what I'm called to do. I am compelled to do it. I cannot help myself. The John Birch Society has been around for 40 years. Think about that. And they have proven themselves to be honest, uh, to believe in God, to believe in family, and believe in a little government. You know, they're not telling you to put government out, but in moderation. And they have information. We have some here today, but they have information that will enlighten you in ways that they can prove everything. This is not hearsay. This is facts. I spent time in the library. I can tell you they can prove everything. So I encourage you to get the information from the John Birch Society. You know, pass it on to friends. Uh, bring in members, bring in fellowship, you know, membership. Join, join the John Birch Society, become a member, and unite. You know, I notice that whenever you stand for truth, most of the time you have to stand alone. You know, I've had many people, oh, I'm on your side, Reverend Peterson, right on. And as soon as the heat come down, I look around, they're gone. <laughs> you know, but I can tell you, the John Birch Society, Society has proven that they will be there. So we need to unite and get this done because there is power in unity, and we can do it. And I appreciate your attention, and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much.